Hi, my name is Andreas Kustas. I am the executive producer of Nordic Business Forum and Oslo Business Forum. And on Wednesday, we have our upcoming webinar with Peter Hinson titled The Phoenix and the Unicorn, the why, the what and the how of corporate innovation. And in that webinar, we are also going to discuss how Huawei are working with corporate innovation. And in that webinar, we will be visited by Zhong Yang Zhao, the chief strategy officer of Huawei Nordics and the Baltics. And I wanted to kick off that discussion already today and, and get to know a bit more about how they work with this. So welcome, Sung Yang. Thank you, Andreas. Very nice to meet you. Good to have you here. So what has been truly interesting this year is that you have been ranked amongst one of the top innovative companies in the world this year, placing sixth in the last report from Boston Consulting Group, which is definitely something uh, interesting and impressive. And I just have to ask, you're obviously doing a lot of things to ensure this development, but what do you see as being the main reason behind this? Thank you for your question. Uh, Huawei has a very strong gene in innovation and investing in the R&D. So we have invested more than 18 billion US dollars in 2019 in R&D. And in the past 10 years, we have invested more than 85 billion US dollars, which is more than all the other, you know, our uh, competitors and the industry stakeholders. So we are very proud of our investment and we will continue the investment uh, in that. Well, that's great. And, and that really creates a good framework for this development for sure. And, and I want to learn more about a couple of topics and, and digging into the first one here being 5G, because in terms of 5G, as you said, you invested a lot over the past decade, the past years, and now it's uh, making the results that you are actually becoming one of the global leaders in this next generation technology, according to a special data center news, which I have been reading. And, and I want to ask, like, what do you think about this development of 5G? Because because we've been talking about 5G for years now in many ways. But now, first now, I think a lot of people are seeing this as becoming a, a realistic option for them. So has the innovation around 5G and its implementation been as quick as you thought it would be five years ago? Yeah, um, I think 5G is uh, innovating very fastly. Uh, as we can see that 5G came out in 2018. Uh, as a start of the 5G, uh, this new generation. Uh, and we also see that more than 38 countries have a devo devel deployed 5G uh, networks around the world. And for Huawei, we have more than 100 customers that's already deployed our 5G network. So we invested heavily in 5G, and I can see that development is very good. Uh, we From the 4G, we have B2C, business to customer, and in 5G, we have more uh, business to business, the B2B angle. And I see that this has evolved very quickly uh, around the world. So different regions have different phases. You know, they are in the different phases of 5G de development. But uh, what I can see is that they are all going through a more uh, customer focused to more customer and enterprise focused. So in Asia, a lot of uh, you know, uh, enterprise use cases have been deployed more in addition to uh, consumer cases. And in the Nordic as well, it's going on very fast, you know, like in Finland, the gaming and also uh, remote uh, ed education. So these kind of all cases have been taking 5G very fast into the next phase. So I think uh, this will continuously uh, benefit our society and uh, benefit customers, uh, uh, consumers and enterprises. That's a, that's a really good point for sure. And, and there's so many different aspects to 5G for, for sure, seeing how we're now moving forward. And, and if you could uh, give us like a specific example of how you've been using this 5G and how you see it will be relevant for us forward, do you have uh, what would you pick out as like one of the best examples of this? Recently, we are using 5G in, the, for example, the remote education that helps the people sitting remotely. They don't have to go to the office or remote uh, workspace. So this this one of the examples. And also we work with enterprise, for example, um, in the mines, which they need to go down very deep in the earth and which uh, needs to a very secure environment and monitoring it, either remote control the machines there. So all these are uh, very good examples. And also port, 
you know, remotely controlled cranes. So this, you know, requires 5G's low latency and a fast speed and also a secure network. So these are very good examples of what we're doing right now. And it's not on the paper, it's we are uh, really, really doing, collaborating with our customers to take it to the commercial. Yeah, and, and definitely we're seeing it more and more as you're saying here and, and just giving the examples. So I'm stationed in Norway and now now we're seeing 5G becoming more and more as an option in the everyday life and and kind of looking a bit forward here because now we're we're finally seeing 5G as becoming, as I said, more and more part of our everyday use, but trying to look into the crystal ball a bit, looking down the road. At some point, I assume we will be starting talking about 6G as well. I don't know if you've started looking into that. And do you think, how far down the line do you think that is? Are we talking like two, five, 10, 15 years? Yeah, normally we have the 10 years for every generation. And uh, so we started, you know, uh, 5G in 2018 and 14 in 2008. So we expect maybe 6G will come in 2028. So roughly eight years, nine years from now on. Uh, and when we discuss about 6G, I think people expect more from this uh, because we have really can achieve a lot in 5G compared with 4G. Uh, and if we compare 5G with 4G, is more uh, enterprise driven and, it, and the consumer use case driven that can enhance our life. Uh, so then relying on the fastest speed and the low latency and in 6G and it's still in, in its early phase. Uh, we are doing our uh, pre-study and R&D together with many other partners in the world as we did in 4G and 5G. Uh, but one thing is clear that 6G will be more for the human beings and the human beings uh, life scenario will be more enhanced and it will be more like an immersed experience for the people and that immersed experience is about uh, every angle of your life of your work of your uh, leisure time of your uh, family time and of your uh, you know all all your personal perspectives can be enhanced with more, uh, you know, cap capacity of 6G, 6G network, including higher speed and more than maybe 100, 100 times more speed and also much lower latency uh, with that. Well, that's super interesting and definitely going to be relevant and really impacting our lives. But uh, I guess that 5G will also do that now in the first uh, place and then, then we'll take it from there, I assume. But another topic that's really interesting that I want to discuss as well is artificial intelligence, which has been quite a buzzword, I would say. But in many ways, it's been similar to 5G because people have been raving about artificial intelligence, AI now for the past years. And in many ways, we are still mostly seeing automation and not necessarily artificial intelligence per se around us, even though a lot of services are, are saying that they are using artificial intelligence. So has the innovation around AI met the expectations that you had for it, let's say five years ago? Yeah, uh, artificial intelligence is one of the areas where we invested very heavily and uh, we have very uh, very advanced solution. So getting back to the basics of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a very broad concept. And people talk about AI, so people think I need a robot who can solve everything of my <laughs> daily life. And actually that's not true right now as everybody sees. So I think when we talk about more specifically what we're doing in AI is more uh, machine learning that you mentioned is um, automation. And this is one of the important angle of AI. And in this machine learning, people use a lot of, uh, you know, mathematic methods together with very high capacity computing to do automated actions of the, you know, things we're doing right now, either manually or either through other ways. So this has been, uh, you know, evolved very fastly. I, I think this can help people's life. So this can help people, you know, enterprises and people to increase the efficiency of their life. Uh, for example, one of the, you know, uh, widely uh, applied scenario is uh, self-driving and by using their image recognition uh, of AI and then develop a self uh, automatic self-driving uh, algorithm. And the same is applied, uh, you know, in uh, medical uh, research to help, you know, to identify, uh, you know, a lot of uh, algorithms of uh, testing and also the lab uh, results. So there are a lot of uh, uh, applications that have been 
uh, applied on top of this machine learning right now. And I can see that in the future going forward, more and more scenarios will be applied in daily life at the same time uh, the fundamental uh, the fundamental knowledge side will be improved from more machine learning to more broader uh, artificial intelligence and it will come I believe uh, it will definitely enhance our uh, daily life well that that's great and and yes as you're saying we're seeing a lot of examples of it already now which I also think will be highly relevant in the years to come and, and you, you're giving some great examples here of how we're seeing this impacting our lives moving forward and and what do you see as being specifically next in AI innovation what's the existing innovation that we will start seeing more often now moving forward you think you mentioned some examples but what's your reflections on that yeah, if we take it into uh, two levels and more uh, on a more specific level, if we talk about machine learning, yes, we're seeing uh, innovation and evolution from more uh, regressional neural, uh, this the R and the regressional neural network and the convolutional neural network CNN into other types of neural network, for example, the gene and the graph neural network, and which is applied in, uh, for example, the research of. Uh, uh, chemical science and are also re applied in the uh, medical research. So these are and also a translation as well. So I think that from the technology side, the evolution would be more efficient, uh, consuming less computing resources, and at the same time be more automated to generate scenarios, not automated to apply this, uh, to accomplish the ac actions, but more automated to generate uh, the codes uh, to apply these actions. So these are more very concrete uh, innovations we see right now. And on a broader scale, I think people are also uh, aiming for a very, very general artificial intelligence, which is back to uh, what people expect. A robot can do whatever you say to it. And then that's still the, the researchers in the world are uh, pushing very hard towards to. And uh, I believe this day will come and uh, we will have those benefits. Thank you so much for explaining and, and elaborating on that. And as you're saying, we're seeing a lot of examples here and it will definitely be uh, an interesting move, uh, the development moving forward. So, but with that, I think I want to wrap it up there and we're going to talk more about this on Wednesday when we have our webinar with Peter Hinson and you will be uh, attending that as well, Zoom Yang. So thank you so much yes. for having this talk. Thank you, Andreas. Okay, see you. Take care.